when I was nine years old, my world collapsed. I was Jewish. That was my crime. If it were not for my home, I come from a Hasidic family. If I didn't know who I was, who I really was, I was being driven on death marches, death all the time, marked with a yellow star. Had I not known that I am a human being from a home that is filled with love for us and for the people in the community, I could not have survived. The most pitiful sight on the death marches were children who thought they were non-Jews until the Nazis went three generations back, thinking they're really good citizens. In Germany, they thought they were good Nazis even. And they said, no, you have no right to live. They killed 93% of the children. It's horrific. I just found this um, a conference of hidden children. It's strange, here I'm an old woman talking about hidden children, but this is what I was. I was a hidden child. This is how I was able to overcome. This Holocaust didn't only happen in Europe. This is another thing that is new to me. I'll give you the countries. I came to Algeria, to Albania, to Morocco, to Libya, Romania, the Ukraine, Tunisia, and Russia. The Germans had a school how to kill without feeling anything. And the most excelled students were the SS Einsatz group. They would march behind every army that was invading. And the first thing they did, they rounded up the Jews. It was a Holocaust without technology. Hammers, axes, saws, whips, anything drowning. Death was desired. Life was unbearable. And yet, I'll tell you just a little bit to put myself on a base. I was the youngest of seven children. My parents hadn't reached age 50. This I found out in Yad Vashem uh, a few years ago. Our home was a home of learning. My mother, I don't know how she did it. How she took care of seven children and her husband without having all the toys that we have, washing machines, dryers, mixers, homemakers. She did everything by hand. I have no idea how she managed it. On top of it, she was a healer and a midwife. So any time, day or night, there was a, a knock on the door or window, she'd just get up, take the things and go. I, I studied in a Jewish day school, what you call today. We learned Romanian, which was the language of the country, and Hebrew, spoken Hebrew. At home, we spoke Yiddish. Uh, we were very close to Bukovina, so German was also familiar to me. Then in 1940, Russia invaded. As a child, for me, the only difference it made was that I had to go to school with non-Jewish children. Till that point, I was totally isolated as a Jew. It was them and us. This is how life was. At four and a half, I dared go out at Easter time. And my friends that I greeted with love beat me up. I was bleeding. I killed Jesus. 
My mother wouldn't kill a fly. I barely made it into the house. Who did I kill? Why would I do such a thing? And she wrapped me in her arms. She said, my child, we live in bad times. You didn't do anything wrong. Next time I asked you not to go out, listen. Not a bad word about my friends. This is when I learned not to hate. Hatred hurts the hater. I didn't understand it in this matter. But my mother didn't say one angry word. Just next time you listen. Thank you, that's perfect. I'm just going to show you, you know, one day you're going to get married and you're going to choose someone that is going to aspire to the things that you aspire. The Jewish home is so important. This is where education begins. This is where a human being is developed. We suffer a great deal today losing our young because the Jewish home, in the best of cases, even the children go to yeshiva. They leave it all to the rabbis. You can't do that. A child needs a mother and a father and a value system that is right. You can't say someone calls you the one here, I'm not home. Say I'm not home. And then you say, you're lying. Hey, you have to be consistent. My mother made sure that we are mitzvah oriented. She, for Rosh Hashanah, she would bake a large challah, one shaped like a ladder, and one was round. For some reason, the middle rose like the fire in Yad Vashem. And I would say, why the ladder? She says, God is waiting for you. He's waiting for your prayers. They go up straight to heaven. I have no pictures of my family. I have no idea what they look like. So much hatred was beaten into me. And I'm determined to tell everyone not to hate. But I remember her deeds. I remember her love. She would give us a piece of pomegranate and say, count the seeds. For every seed, you should do a mitzvah. You should do a chesed. But she never came and asked Leah, how many mitzvahs did you do and how many seeds did you do? She knew that we would do as she wanted. Now, there were no rich people, but there were lots of poor. And she always made sure to give to the poor. Now, before Yom Kippur, there is a custom that if you're a man, you use a rooster around the head. If you're a woman, you do you use a chicken. And this is al kapara. I don't use it. For some reason, I was so sorry for the chicken that I can't use it. But there are hundreds of thousands of Jews who do use it still. What I do is money. I do it with money and put money into, into Stockholm. What do you do with a mischievous girl on Rosh Hashanah in a shoe? My mother found what to do. She told us to count the blasts of the shofar. Who counts more gets a reward. What was the reward? A fruit. We didn't have all we wanted to eat. A fruit was a great reward. Calling my mother to speak to her, to help, to heal, was a normal, everyday thing for me. But one night in October 1941, there was 
severe banging around my house. And the neighbor, neighbors were calling, Donna Bracha, Lady Bracha, wake up and wake everyone because in the morning they'll burn you alive. Now imagine, she did so much for that community. But she believed them. Well, things were going on that I was unaware of, that Hitler had invaded Poland in 41. There were a lot of immigrant people who fled, and there were some housed in my house, but I had no idea that there was a war. So my mother woke us up. She put garment upon garment upon us, and we left our home, and that was the last night of my childhood. I never had a bed again, never had a home again. I was to watch my family perish one by one from hunger, from cold, from brutality. I had two sis twin sisters. They, I have no idea about their age, but they were about, I would say, 13, 14. My mother shaved their hair off. You have no idea how the Romanians tormented young girls and young women, often in front of their home, of their family. So this is why my mother took their hair off and put mud on their faces. They shouldn't be identified. And thank God they were not. They didn't go through that fate. You see, education, I'm a very big believer in education. I myself have completed seminar and I have a degree in history and Jewish studies. But it's not enough. You need a Jewish identity. You need to know who you are. And you can't blame your parents anymore because you're mature now. You just go and get it. We ran from our home and we were on the road and lots of other people fled. First time I saw an airplane, it was a machine that dropped death from the skies. Those who died were lucky, but those who suffered wounds and great pain, they didn't say, help me. They said, Jews, save yourselves. They have come to slaughter us. You see, in this Holocaust, to die wasn't a Kiddush Hashem. You were not sanctifying God's name, although millions died sanctifying God's name. More sanctified was the one who survived to tell the story, because the world is denying. You study history, they're going to say, study the deniers and the survivors. Come to a middle of point, middle of the road. There was no middle of the road if you were a Jewish infant. If you had a drop of Jewish blood, there was no middle of the road. If you died, you were lucky. Your pain was over. But Jews believe in life, no matter what. Children, we used to sometimes gather and say to each other, if you survive, tell. Well, for 52 years, I didn't tell. There were no words to explain what happened to me. I have three sons, and I decided not to tell them. They would ask, Mom, you had parents, right? You had sisters and brothers, right? But what happened to them? They died. What do you mean they died? How? There was a war. When you grow up 
okay, maybe they'll write a story about me. And I thank God that I had the inspiration not to tell them. Because I know people who told them this story in their lives. Kids ran off to the movies. All kinds of things happened to them. Because morning, noon, and night, they got the story of a parent who suffered so much and wanted their children to know. But I didn't tell. I worked in a community where I was teaching. And there were other child survivors who became very good Canadians, as I was. Everyone thought I was a Canadian. No one imagined the pain I was living with, especially I was teaching for 40 years Holocaust to children. I would tell them, whatever I say to you is true. It happened. I would tell them as little as I could. But one day, at the end of my, just as I was retiring to do what I'm doing, a little boy came in with a book and showed it to me at the end of the session. Moralea, would you please read this book? It was, it had maybe six pages with pictures. And the name of the book is Where is Willie? You see a little boy and his sister in a normal home, happy, happy in school, happy at home. He turned the page and he's marked. And his smile disappeared. The joy of living disappeared. He sits in school still, but he's marked, can't come back which meant your life isn't worth any more than a cockroach. Next picture we see him, he's in the ghetto in Warsaw, but every ghetto was hell. You see death all around him, and little Willie, who may be four or five, is trying to open his little sister's mouth and put something in. You could see that she's about to die. And I turn the page and it's empty. And the children, as if they rehearsed it, Moralea, where is Willie? And I was so shattered by this little book. And I said, you tell me. You tell me, please, where is Willie? And the answer came with uncontrollable weeping. I dismissed the class. And the principal says, what have you done to these children? I said, you know what I did? I told them about one. When I started teaching the Holocaust and I talked about six million, they said, how many streets will we need for candles? Remember the candles. You can't grasp numbers like that. These children died alone. They didn't have a hand to comfort them. I said, I told the children about the one. And I want you to do likewise. Find the child. Yad Vashem, the museums all over the world have names, they even have pictures. Adopt the child, bring him home to your Shabbos table, to the festivals you celebrate. That's where you bring him back to life. Rabbis say that their soul is in you. You have their souls. They wanted to live as Jews so badly. You can live for them. Embrace their love. At the same time, embrace who you are. Because we're losing our young to assimilation and intermarriage. We were 18 million before the war. 
We are barely 13 million, 70 years later. The more you turn pages of Jewish history, the prouder you will be. Think of the Germans. There are many children of Nazis in Israel. They have converted some of them to Judaism and raised their kids religious. And there was one incident. The son of one of these very well-known people in Israel, the son went to Auschwitz on the March of the Living with, of course, his schoolmates. And his son was standing looking in in the, in the crematoria. And the Jewish boy said, the one who was born Jewish, of a, they also born Jewish. Your grandfather killed my grandfather. Right? And the child took such exception. He was so insulted. The Jewish community had came crawling on their knees for saying their apologies. And you'll learn Holocaust, you will see someone going to his death, gives his little piece of bread to someone who's living, gives his sandals to someone who's living, sharing the little bit that they have. They couldn't destroy our humanity, but they did horrible things to us. The highest educated nation in the world, in music and art and what not. They were able to eat their sandwich, watch children suffocate and listen to Bach at the same time. I'm not going to try and tell you what it's like to live with this. For 50 years, I was in Canada, 52 years. I was the happiest little girl. I went into total hiding. If someone spoke about the Shoah, I started singing. I couldn't have built myself and remember. By night, I remember. The night nightmares didn't stop. But by day, I was building. I was teaching kids. I was lucky to be brought to Canada at age 16. I'll go back and I'll tell you how. A very wealthy family sponsored me, fostered me. But their home was void of Jewishness. No candle was ever lit. No kashu, no yante, and I couldn't say that I missed it. They had the best of intentions. So I went to high school. I had the most wonderful spinster teacher, Miss Grant. She was wonderful. The only Jew in the class. The girls used to meet me at the gate and walk arms and arms to the class. They must have been told that this new girl is survivor. But they were wonderful. And this family was worried that I might get too friendly with the non-Jewish boys. Tragically, a younger son married the first generation German. He didn't have what to offer her. The chuppah was in my house. She converted. She was pregnant and she had a baby. But he didn't have what to offer her. She was a good Christian. So in the end, he baptized. And his two children are Christian. There's nothing wrong with being anything. It's your Jews. You have a history of thousands of years. Not only should you build your home, you should make Shabbos, invite others and don't tell them anything. Let them just breathe it in, just see it. The love that exists on Shabbos. 
and on festivals. Embrace it. There are lots of people who embrace it. There is one person I met in Israel, Asha Wey. He had a church of his own in Germany. His wife, the, her father was a priest. And they did research on the Shoah, and they found that Luther wrote the epistle for the Shoah. And two of them, young couple said, do we want this for our children? And they decided to convert. So they went to reform, and they didn't like what they heard. They went to intermediate, conservative, wasn't strong enough for them. These were spiritual people. Finally, they came to an Orthodox rabbi, and the rabbi says, you got to go Hasidic because every Orthodox rabbi will find you a threat. You are so filled with love. You are so knowledgeable. You shouldn't be hurt. So he became a chassid. Asher Wei, very well known in Yerushalayim. He and his wife went to the same seminary my daughter-in-law went to. That's where they met. So here to my story. It's easy to tell you a lot of other things than my own story. We came to an adjacent city. Everybody was there, outside. To this day, I don't know why they ordered us to go into an empty home. I do not remember how long we were there. I remember Shabbos. My father was softly singing the Kiddush. We were all standing around him. And no sooner did he finish the Kiddush, we were standing to wash, to make a bracha over the bread, when severe knocking in the shutters and the windows, Zidane, dirty Jew, open up. Our parents, without words, motioned we should run and hide, which we did. They opened the door, and the Nazis came in. Where are the children? They wouldn't answer. They said, we'll kill you and they'll be orphans. They couldn't make peace with that. They called us in. We were lined up in front of a wall according to size. One bullet should go from skull to skull. I don't remember crying. I just remember starting to say Shema Yisrael. And my parents said, don't worry. Soon we'll be in Grenada together in paradise. It didn't occur to me to worry. I saw so much death. I was thinking it'll be over. A shooting squad was in front of me, guns pointing, when suddenly I hear a rough voice saying, put down your guns, don't shoot. I opened my eyes, what now? The Romanians didn't want to put down their guns. We have lots of work to do. But he could have turned the gun on them. So they reluctantly, begrudgingly put down their guns. And this head of the shooting squad pointed to my mother. You see this woman? If not for her, my mother and I wouldn't be alive. We, I was a very difficult birth. She came and she saved us both. So many times I woke her up, she never refused to come and help. Let them go. We all ran to my mother, we hugged her and kissed her and thanked her for say, giving us life. But I tell you, had they shot us, they would have done a great deed. Because I know what waited for us. I went through it. But we don't understand the ways of Hashem. Everything that happens in the world is not a coincidence. A Malik believes a coincidence. I call it Hashkacha Pratit. 
heavenly supervision and the hand of Hashem that I feel to this day. They commanded us to go back to our city. We got there. Our house was empty. Doors and windows were taken. We lay down on the bare floor. We still had the clothes that we fled with. Early in the morning, it was still dark outside. The Nazis came with dog. Zidane, you have five minutes to be in the market square. You don't need food or drink. You're going one way, you're never coming back. I didn't understand what's going on. But I was terribly frightened. And I ran to the market square. It was October 1941. It was so cold. Romania is a cold country. Being light, every disease in the world that a child has, I had before this time. I was skinny. You wouldn't pay, bet a penny for my survival. But it's, it was all God's watching over me. It wasn't me. To this day, when I go to sleep, I feel the hand of Hashem. The rabbi was standing with a talus and a sefer Torah. Every man that had a talus wore, and they were not going to a prayer session. They knew they were going to their death. I was still clueless. My par parents came, and I ran after my mother, and I held her hand. When are we going home? It's so cold. I'm hungry. My mother never gave an answer. She just wept. Being a child of a religious home, I knew that if you do something wrong, you get punished. If you do something right, you get a reward. I asked the big question. What crime have we committed? Why do we deserve such a punishment? My mother doubled up with weeping, and I didn't ask any more questions. The roads were not paved. It was mud. It was so hard to take out one foot in front of the other. The old, they killed. The babies, they killed. The sick, they killed. And a Jew must never give up hope. We try to go forward. In the morning, the rain stopped and the sun came up. And a Nazi car, SS Einsatzgruppen, stops right in front of me, urges me to come over to them. I knew that they were killers, and I froze in place. My parents fell on their knees. Leave her alone. She's our child. And Nazis kept on saying that I was stolen. This is a horrendous, Horrendous scene I'll never forget. But there's a miracle in there. And no, I'm not mad. There was a miracle. I didn't know that I looked like them. I don't remember if there were mirrors in my home. Along with everything else, I don't remember. I was my mother's child. My hair was never cut. Blonde, blue-eyed, pale face. This is the kind of nation they wanted to build. All others, they had enough ways of getting rid of. And here I was, a Nazi child, going to death with the Jews. That they let me go and didn't kill us all is a miracle. But from that moment on, I became the provider. I figured if they think that I look like them, then the peasants will also believe me when I come to ask for help. 
And so when we marched in the Romanian side, I spoke Romanian. When we came to the Russian side, the Ukraine, I spoke Russian. Whether they believed what I said, that I'm a Russian child or not, is not important. The important thing is that if they gave me a crust or a potato, it facilitated, it enabled me to be here today. And my family lasted a little longer. I don't know if I did them a favor or not. Because living was hell. The only hope we had was death. My mother believed that Mashiach is going to come any minute and save us. And I remember her saying to me, Leila, Mashiach will come in a world that is totally wicked or totally good. Now, I couldn't imagine a more wicked world than this. So I walked with the hope of Mashiach coming. Only he could have saved us. People were being whipped. The Nazis had a whip with a rock at the end of it. If a child sat down, I'm not going any further. And a parent or a sibling would want to pick him up. They would finish them. They were either, either dying or dead. They wanted to destroy our humanity. But here I am. I still believe that man is basically good. As we were marching, my health, my feet were giving out. My shoes were worn down. And now I was thinking of sitting down. My parents got the message and they urged me not to do it. You know, when it rained, if you picked up your foot to take out whatever was in there, I was barefoot. You could run. The water was that high. There were no sewage systems. It was as primitive as you can imagine. Then I looked at the Nazis who were leading us. They had wagons full of food and drink. I drank from the mud puddles when it rained, but when it didn't rain, it was horrible. I would take anything, a piece of grass, anything, put in my mouth to create some saliva. And as I looked at these wicked people that were driving us, I saw one human face that I, nine and a half year old, decided that he is a mensch, he's a human. And I decided to tear out of the death march to the, to the life march, the gendarmes, the, those that were driving us. They walked with everything, some of them on, on the horses. Once I decided he is a human, I ran over, but I could reach him. It took me a long time. He had long legs. I was shorter than I am now, and I ran very hard to reach him. When I reached him, he was totally unaware of me. I pulled at his jacket, and he looked down from up there, and he said the most amazing, the most wonderful words. He said, child, what do you want? So I wasn't a bug, I was a child. My heart filled with hope. And I said to him, what do you gain if I die? He looked at me again, filthy, marked up. Little girl, what do you want? I said, let me sit in your wagon. If you can't do that, please, I beg you, shoot me. Don't let me suffer anymore. And this giant was human. He stretched out his long arms, he picked me up, and sat me in his wagon, and even put a blanket around my swollen stomach with hunger and cold. This is how I survived the death march. But my family, among others, were behind me. And 
it was not a trace of jealousy. And this came to me when we made Aliyah 14 years ago, and the Intifada broke out. Suddenly, the whole scene came before my eyes. They must have pointed me out as a possible survivor. You see, just three years ago, they found a pit in the Ukraine with 8,000 skulls. No address. Nobody knows who they are. Entire communities were wiped out without a sign that they ever lived a Jew. And here my family was hoping that maybe I will survive. Maybe I will be a remnant. I promise you that I never believed that I'll survive. It was a question of when. We came to a place called Yedinism. They closed the den outside, on the mud, everybody lay down. They did terrible things to people. But it, adding to our pain was a bakery right near the fence. Our pain of hunger intensified. And I sat and I held on to the fence and I said, please God, send a child my age. Maybe I could have helped my family. In the morning, a little girl comes out with books under her arm. And I called to her in Romania. She was shocked that the third people over there marked to death know her language. But she was a child and she was curious. And she came over and I asked her, do you like school? And she said, no, I'm stupid. What grade are you in? She says, four. My education ended in grade three. I said to her, bring your books. Maybe I can help you. Sure enough, she comes to the side of life, opens her books. And I'm her tutor. It was so good to be a child again. The mother comes out and she says, stupid. Why to talk to her? She done. Never, 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 dear students, never call your children names. I was a teacher for 50 years, and many times I lied for a student. But they came saying, I'm stupid, there's no point in trying. I erased out of the 10 words that all mistakes. Show four correct ones, see you did four today, next time try for five. And the child would begin to grow. And the parents would come, how is my marshal? I tell them, he's really very bright and trying very hard. Morale, you're talking about someone else. It's not my marshal. Now that's a crime against that child. To, to mark him as stupid. Don't, if you want to call your children name, called the Miriam the prophet is, Sarah Rivka Rachel Balea, who built a nation. Don't call them anything bad. A child takes something, he doesn't know what it is to be a thief. He figures, you had it enough, it's my turn now. Doesn't mean we should agree with it. But don't call him a thief, because he's going to want to find out what is a thief and become one. You know, Churchill said, the hand that rocks cradle rules the world. After we were there for a few weeks, and my mother, you see, they were instant orphans. They took away the young parents, and they never came back. So she took as many little orphans, four-year-old, five-year-old, and shared everything. This woman gave us a bread and a cake. Everything equal with those children. But then we were commanded to go to the Dniester. The Dniester divided Romania from the Ukraine. Now it's all Ukraine. They tell us to give back. You know, they never give back. We came to the Dniester and it was already winter and I don't understand how I got 
that far, being the sickly child that I was. Nesta was semi-frozen. And we were to cross to the Ukraine on a very primitive bridge. Maybe 10% of us survived at this point, maybe less. We were still too many. Those little children, they threw him, threw them into the cold water, and they were calling for help, and no one came to help them. I was so traumatized, I didn't learn how to swim to this day. Because every time I go into a lake, I hear those children calling for help. We came to the other side, four generations in front of their home, all dead. The hands sticking out of the snow. Dogs walking around with human parts. A hand, a head. It was hell. But this was my reality every day. One of my sisters cried in one of the pigsties all night. She was sick and cold and hungry. In the morning she was silent and we were driven on with guns in our back. We finally got to a place called Kapaigoro. My twin sisters, my mother and I, there they told us to go into a house, into a barn. It had a very suitable name, the house of death. When I came in and I saw people were dying or dead and there was a pile of bodies at the entrance because it was too cold to bury them. I grabbed a bag and I said to my mom, I'm going to find food. And I pushed my body under the fence and came to the Ukrainians and told them I was a Russian child in Russia. I need help. Can I help you? Sometimes they would take me to dig potatoes out. <clears throat> the pigs were fed because they had value. They used to feed them boiled potatoes. I stole from the pigs and they saw me doing it and didn't kill me. They facilitated my survival. One day, my sister, Rivka, was motionless. And the day after, my sister, Liba, was motionless. And so it was just my mother and I. Every time I go in and out, I see their bodies on a pile. And I did cry. I knew that that's my address. That's where I'm going to be. My mother didn't look human anymore. She was a skeleton, but her hair turned gray. There was so much fear in her eyes, but she had hope. She kept on telling me, I must live, I must remember, and I must tell the world. At that time, she was worried about deniers. Basically, she forbade me to die. So one day when I came back from looking for food, I found a naked body on the floor because whatever she wore, the living needed. It was so unbecoming for my mother to see her in that degrading fashion. Everything that I had in my bag, I said to the people, you give me a garment for my mother, you can have all that I have. I got a garment, covered her, and they put her on top of her daughters. And after a long weeping session, I went to look for life. I had no idea what the words meant, live, remember, tell the world. All I knew was that I'm not allowed to die. In a distance, I saw a little hut. I had to see that there are no children and no dogs. A very young woman was cradling a baby. I knocked and she came to the door and she burst out weeping and crossing herself. I must have been a terrible sight. She sat me down at a very primitive table and chair, put down the baby and brought me a 
hot bowl of soup. It was so divine. She saw that I finished the soup, she stood in front of me with the dress. I was covered with lines. I understood that she wants me to put on her dress so that she will put my rags into the oven and burn the lines. See, I had to understand these things. I'm still nine years old. I'm not to be 10 till February. This is November, December. I put on her dress, and she comes with a little container, and she said, child, lice don't like neft. You know what neft is, but used for the cars, for like in the lab. She cleaned out my hair, and washed my hair and let me sleep above the oven, the most coveted place in the house. I slept four hours. Her husband comes in, sees me eating soup. Zhidovka! And what other child would be out on such a night alone? Yes, I told him. Where from, he asks. I tell him, Popaido. Oh, he says, you are a lucky Zhidovka. I burst out crying, telling him about my luck. He says, stop crying. I'll tell you why you're so lucky. He says, you left your mother about three days ago. That's when they drove all the Jews who could walk into the forest and burn them alive. So God save you, save you, Zhidovka. So one year I hear my mother that I must live. And here this boy tells me that God saved me. And he did. Had nothing to do with me. I was there for a few days sleeping with the animals because it was dangerous to have a Jew in the house. After a few days she told me I have to move on. I moved on. The next house I wanted to warm up the dogs found me first before I found the door. They attacked me, they opened up my right sheet completely, my lip, my hand was barely hanging on. The woman came out and pulled my unconscious body into her hub. She cleaned my face with alcohol and sewed it up with a needle and thread. You know, miraculously, it began to heal. But if she's so kind, why did she have dogs? Fish is dogs. Would you think about why she had those dogs? You get the top mark. Then you can you can guess. No. You see, the roads of Transnistria, with the hell that I was in Ukraine, were covered with thousands of orphans seeking a place to warm up and a morsel of food. She didn't want them in her house. She didn't know I was a Jew. I didn't look like a Jew. Whether she knew I must have somehow Dreamed a bad dream, but again I was with the animal. She would not hurt it. After a few days, she told me I have to move on. Somewhere on the road between Kopaigorod and Mogilov, I fainted. I had malaria. I wouldn't have known it if the doctors, after my release, didn't torment me when I had malaria because I had a small relapse. But someone picked me up and healed me. I missed that whole winter. I found myself in the spring on the road. Birds were chirping and there were butterflies and gorgeous flowers and it was warm. What happened to the winter? But they tormented me in the orphanage. To what, when I had malaria, I told them I lost the winter. They said that's when you had malaria. I made my way to Mogilov. My mother's older sister was there. I was hoping to find her. And I did find her. She had one child survive. 
my age, my cousin Arala. And she said to me, you are lucky. You lost both your parents. Arala is not lucky because I'm still alive. You can go to the orphanage. I went to the orphanage. The orphanage was a place of hell. On a narrow bed, four of us slept. I don't remember any bed. The girl I slept with face to face had tuberculosis. She was coughing her blood. It's extremely contagious. I didn't get it. She died after the war in the orphanage. But in the orphanage, the situation was very bad. If they needed people, numbers, to send to the horrible death camp, Pichora, they went to the orphanage and they took the children. So four girls, we decided to escape to the non-Jewish side. Each one was hiding in a different bombed out house. And we promised each other, if one is found, not to tell that there's more. We used to wake up in the morning and play with stone, sing that, tick bomb, and tell each other how good life will be if we survive. I don't know if any of them survived. Life wasn't good. It was a very horrible, cruel world that I survived in. First, I had to declare myself a non-Jew, and I lived as such, helping a woman in a cafe. Her, her customers were SS Einsatzgruppen. I used to bring them food and clear out for them. I could have stayed there forever, but Hashem sent a messenger, an educated messenger. He had a pharmacy two doors down from the little cafe. He was drunk and he said, Bukovska ta I am a Jew, that's why she's doing so well. Well, Hashem sent the solution. The Nazis were beginning to lose the war in Russia. And Romania looked for a way out. They fought with the Nazis. The Nazis were invited into Romania. They wanted to join the Allies. So the Romanian Führer said, you can bring back if there's any orphans alive, on one condition, that they go to Palestine, to Eretz Israel. It was a wonderful condition. Bukowska, my keeper, went one day to the ghetto. She saw it was a lit with song and promise. And she knew where I was from, where I was born. She said, Lydia, if you stay, we both die. If you go, we can both survive. She took me to the commission that approved of children to be brought back to Romania. They didn't believe me, I was Jewish. I had forgotten the languages of my childhood because they meant death. Twice they refused me. The third time my teacher was on the committee and he said so far she's the only one from the school. And so I found myself on a train, a luxury train, with birth, like little rooms that you can sleep, with kosher food they provided. But we didn't ask each other what happened to you. We kept on saying to each other, the world will be so good to us. It didn't happen. I was in the orphanage, scheduled to leave for Israel in, like the next day, the night before my appendix burst. I lost consciousness, and we were housed in a wing of the hospital that was just finished being built. So they brought me to the hospital. The surgeon said it's too late. There's no point in them operating. And there was a young doctor there, an orthopedic surgeon, and he was listening to what I was saying from my fever and unconsciousness. 
And he said, I would like to have permission to try and save her. He did. He put tubes into my stomach. For a month, I, I was between death and life. They didn't know if I'd make it. Took six months to recover. Today, God forbid, you can die from that. And 60 orphans, along with 350 survivors, went on a boat called Mariska, and they never got to the promised land. They were torpedoed, and they were no survivors. So why wasn't I in that boat? Why did my appendix burst just at this time? Eventually, I, I got a Polish identity because it's amazing that's happening now in Israel to be illegals. They wanted the Poles out of Romania, so they gave us some of money and a free ticket. We couldn't leave Romania because the communists didn't let anybody leave. So we got as far as Hungary, Budapest, and then we went off the train. And young women and men called Briha were calling in the night, Amcha, Amcha. So we know they're Jews, means your nation. And they could, we crossed borders nights. And we came to a place called, um, in, in Austria, uh, at the senior moment. And then I went to ask for help, because running away from the train, everything was left on the train. And a young social worker, Greta 